So we left off here speaking about the first factor. So we said the first factor that influences the force generated by an individual muscle fiber is the frequency of stimulation. How frequently or how fast are we firing action potentials and that can influence how much force the muscle is able to generate. There were two ways that we illustrated the increased frequency of stimulation. The first phenomenon was called TREP. And TREP we described as being more force being generated when a muscle is stimulated. Um, and so with each subsequent action potential, the amount of tension generated slightly increases until we get to the maximum force generated um, for that specific muscle. Okay, and we also describe that TREP is not fully understood because we don't quite know why TREP occurs, especially because in between each of these action potentials, the muscle is able to fully relax, which means that all the calcium leaves the cytoplasm, the muscle fully relax, but for some reason, the subsequent contraction generates more force, even though the action potential is the exact same. All right. The theory that we described as to why this may be occurring is that the machinery is already warmed up. So troponin is already excited. Uh, myosin is already excited. The sarcomere is already excited. So all of the machinery that's required is already warmed up so that the next action potential is going to result in um, machinery that's really just ready to go. And so it's going to generate a little bit more force until we get to the maximum force uh, possible for this specific muscle. Um, and it's really important to understand this because this is how TREP differs from summation, okay? And we'll go on to look at summation. So summation is that for each action potential, um, the action potential lasts about two milliseconds. The contraction can last anywhere between 10 to 200 milliseconds. So contractions can overlap and sum, okay? Um, so basically, if several action potentials are generated within the period that it takes one contraction to be completed, then that additional action potential can result in more force being generated. And so this is where trap and summation differ because summation does not allow the muscle to fully relax. The contraction is still going on. It's still being sustained. And then more action potentials are coming along. And so the muscle never relaxes, but then the subsequent action potentials generate more force. And so summation can be explained you know, by the mechanism where that contraction uh, exceeds the, the, the time of a single action potential. So here is our action potential. This is our initial stimulus. Here is one twitch, okay, generating X amount of tension or force. The muscle relaxes. And then we have another action potential. The muscle generates force, but notice it doesn't fully relax, right? Whereas for trap, we had complete relaxation. That tension went all the way to zero in between each of those action potentials. For summation, that doesn't occur. So the muscle doesn't fully relax. So we can better explain why when the next action potential comes around, we generate even more force because we're not starting the baseline. We're starting from an already contracted sarcomere. All right. With the third action potential, again, we're starting from an even higher amount of force generation, and then we're generating even more force, and then the muscle can fully relax. So summation is on the basis that an action potential lasts a very short period, and the period with which the initial action potential is maintaining its contraction, more action potentials can be generated, and that can allow for even more force generation uh, with more action potentials being uh, fired. 
Now, if we have the frequency of those action potentials increase even more so, then we can get into what's called tetanus. So the first stage of that is incomplete or unfused tetanus, which is where very little relaxation is happening in between. So we have our first action potential, slight relaxation, even more force generation from the subsequent action potential. And then we get to a period where the maximum force allowed um, has been reached, right? The, the, the muscle is generating as much force as it can, and that will plateau. Now, this is considered unfused because there is still slight relaxation happening in between, whereas in complete or fused tetanus, there is absolutely zero chance for relaxation, and the contraction is fused and completely sustained. All right. Now, this can lead to a very dangerous state in the muscle. This is what we call um, tetanic contractions, which is where the muscle is pretty much spasming. Um, there is zero relaxation happening in between, and this can eventually lead to fatigue, right, where the muscle just gives out because it is overworked. It has exhausted all of the ATP that is required to activate the myosin head and to keep the contraction going. So we have summation. And then if we increase the frequency some more, we'll get incomplete tetanus or unfused tetanus where there's still some bit of relaxation. And then if we increase the frequency even more, we'll get complete tetanus or fused tetanus. Okay. Now, again, just to go over the mechanism that explains summation and then tetanus is the amount of tension is increasing as the amount of calcium in the sarcoplasm increases. So as more calcium is flooding into the sarcoplasm, more of it can bind to troponin. Um, and then there's gonna be uh, more reuptake initially. So there's more reuptake, which allows for a faster relaxation. But then with the fused tetanus, there is zero relaxation happening. So there's zero uptake of that calcium. Okay. Um, now, eventually, there's going to be a period where we completely saturate the system. All the troponin will be maxed out, but they'll have as much calcium as can be bound to that troponin. So there will be maximum crossword cycling. And this is a state that is referred to as maximum tetanic contraction. Okay, maximum tetanic contraction. That is to say that it, even if there were more action potentials coming along, the muscle could not possibly generate any more force and there is zero relaxation happening in between those contractions. Okay, so that is the first factor that affects the force generation by a muscle. That is the frequency of the action potentials. The second force that we'll go on to look at is the fiber diameter, right? This is the fiber diameter, the size of the muscle fibers. Um, and if we recall, the force generated by a muscle is equal to the, um, the amount of cross bridge cycles that are happening on the sarcomeres within that muscle. So more cross bridge cycles per sarcomere equals more force being generated. Uh, another way to say that is more cross, more sarcomeres in parallel, okay? So not only more cross bridges on a single sarcomere, remember a single sarcomere is what's happening on one myofibril, but we have many myofibrils sort of packed inside that muscle fiber. So if we have more myofibrils packed in parallel, then we will also generate more force. And that leads us to thinking about the diameter of the muscle. How thick is that muscle fiber? Because if it's really thick, if it has a wider diameter, that means it's got more myofibrils inside and therefore it has more sarcomeres and therefore it has the capacity for more cross bridge cycling. Now the number of thick and thin filaments is constant. So that's not something that can change. Um, if we have one myofibril, the number of uh, myosin and actin on that doesn't change. What can change 
is how many myofibrils are packed inside that muscle fiber. The other thing that doesn't necessarily change is the number of muscle fibers, okay? This is something that's pretty constant. Um, and again, we can make that muscle fiber bigger by putting more myofibrils inside. That is how a muscle gets larger or gets stronger. When you go to the gym and you lift heavy weights, what you're doing is you're increasing the number of myofibrils that are inside your single muscle fiber. So the number of muscle fibers is constant. The number of thick and thin filaments on each sarcomere is also constant. But what can change with training is the number of myofibrils. And for every myofibril that is added, the fiber gets bigger. The diameter, the thickness of the muscle gets bigger, which is why muscles look more bulky. Um, and, and so that can also increase the amount of force that can be generated from those bigger muscles. So that was our second factor. So frequency and then diameter. The third factor is the fiber length. The length of the fiber at the onset of the contraction. So when we think about the sarcomere, it is usually going to generate the most amount of force when it is at its optimal length. So it's the resting length at which the fiber can contract the most and generate the highest amount of force or tension. And the reason for that is because there's the maximum amount of overlap in between the thick and thin filaments. And so as we mentioned, if we can have more cross bridge cycling happening or more area for overlap, we can generate more force. Now, this is not something that we can readily um, uh, manipulate in our body simply because our muscles are suspended across uh, bones. So our muscles are stretched. And so typically in our body, uh, in situ, our muscles are already at their optimal length. So that is not something that we have much control over just because our muscles are in a position where they're already suspended across two, um, two bones or across a joint and they are already at their optimal length. Okay, so let's look at some less than optimal lengths or greater than optimal lengths. So these are some of the non-optimal lengths. If the sarcomere is greater than optimal, there's going to be decreased cross bridge overlap. Okay, let's think about the scenario over here at C. So notice how we're starting with the sarcomere that is stretched out. The length is greater than optimal. And so because it's so stretched out, when cross bridge cycling does occur, the area of overlap is gonna be significantly shortened. And so muscles that are starting at a stretch out sarcomere will generate less force than muscles that are starting at the optimal length, okay? On the other end, when the length is less than optimal, which is here, the sarcomere starts really jammed in, right? really tightly contracted. And if you start the contraction on a sarcomere that is already significantly contracted, there is not much room for overlap. There's not much room for sliding. And so the thin and thick filaments are so uh, overlap already, overlap already. The Z discs are so compacted or close to each other already that again, there's very little space for sliding or for overlap to generate significant force. So the best length for the muscle to be at to generate the maximum amount of force that is possible for that muscle is to be at optimal length, neither too contracted, which is what's happening on the left here, or too, ex too stretched or too expanded, which is happening on the right, okay? Um, now what I'll mention here, and this will come back when we look at the cardiac muscle, is cardiac muscle is typically at its optimal length. Um, and so the more we stretch the, uh, the, 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 um, the cardiac muscle fibers, the more force that they will be able to generate. So it's a different relationship with the optimal length here. For cardiac muscle, and this is when we get into the Starling's law of the heart, the more we stretch the sarcomeres out, the more force they're gonna generate, 
the more contraction you're going to allow for. So it's going to become more advantageous to stretch the heart out more to generate more force. With skeletal muscle, that is not the case. Stretching the sarcomere out more does not equal more force. In fact, it equals less force. Um, and again, we'll make that comparison when we get to cardiac muscle. 